Welcome to episode number two from Evolution Series number one. And in this episode, we're going to talk about five guys who influenced Charles Darwin's thinking. And first off, I want to start with Bishop Usher. Uh, Bishop Usher, if you remember from your history class, was a theologian, and he's back in around, you know, 1600, uh, 17th century. And he uh, basically, he's reading the Bible and some other religious um, writings, and he gleams from all that information that the earth was created on October 23rd, 4004 B.C. Now, a later theologian took Usher's work, did a little bit more research, and he figured out that the earth was created at 9 a.m. London time, which would have been midnight, October 23rd, 4004 B.C., Garden of Eden time. Now, this ridiculous idea was actually the accepted hypothesis during Charles Darwin's time. So at that time, the earth is maybe five, 6,000 years old at the most. All right. So the one thing that uh, Darwin was going to have to overcome is the earth is going to have to be old enough for his process of evolution to occur. And he gets that when he comes across the work of two, ge two different geologists, James Hutton and Charles Lyell. And these are both British geologists, and it was Hutton who stated that the earth is much older than what Bishop Usher said. In fact, the earth is millions upon millions of years old. That's a huge difference than the few thousand-year-old uh, hypothesis from Bishop Usher. And now the earth is going to be long enough and old enough for this mechanism of evolution to occur. Now, the next guy that had a big influence was a gentleman named Lyell. And Lyell was talking about phenomena. And he said that natural phenomena, such as erosion, uh, what we would call plate tectonics at the time, he wouldn't have known about that, but that's one of the phenomena he would, would foot under his, uh, his category. Uh, volcanism and, um, you, know, you know, wind and rain, you know, other parts of erosion. He says these phenomena have been going on for millions of years, and they have a natural cycle and pace to them. And so the phenomenon that we see today, rain, wind, ice, volcanoes, earthquakes, these same things had happened millions and millions of years ago, and they've been shaping the earth pretty much since its inception. And so Charles Darwin looks at it, he interprets their work as A, the earth is old enough for my theory of natural selection to work, B, if we have natural phenomena that has been shaping the earth geologically since its inception, then we will have natural phenomena that has been shaping how life looks like on this planet since it got here. All right, so let's move on to the next guy. Uh, this is a French guy named Jean de Baptiste Lemoc. All right, he's a French naturalist, and he actually proposes a theory of evolution. Now, the concept of having a theory of evolution is very controversial. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck had his critics. And the one problem with Lamarckian evolution is that he had the wrong mechanism. But he should be applauded for recognizing that living things will change over time. He just didn't have the right mechanism. So what was his mechanism? Well, it's got three parts. There is a tendency towards perfection. According to Lamarck, a living thing would make a conscious effort to strive to be better. Now, Darwinian evolution is going to refute that and prove that it's not true. But for Lamarck, he was pretty sure that any living thing was striving individually to become more adapted to its surroundings. Okay? Now, there would be selective use and disuse. This is what would allow the organism to change. It's striving towards perfection, so then it would use a body part more more in order to make it stronger. Okay. Now, as you created your new body structures through use and disuse, we would call that an acquired trait. And Lamarck believed that you could pass on these acquired traits. So, 
For example, this would be Lamarckian evolution in action. All right, let's say you're a blacksmith and you've been pounding on that steel for hours after hours, year after year, decade after decade. You are selectively using one of your arms and that arm's gonna be big and strong. Now what Lamarck would find out, or actually he would notice, is that the blacksmith's son would develop really big, strong arm muscles, just like dad. Well, duh, dad does the job where he's using that arm all the time. He's essentially working out every day. His kid's gonna work the same job. He's gonna develop muscles. Lamarck saw that as big muscles from dad the blacksmith, those big muscles were acquired through selective use and disuse because dad is striving towards perfection. The bigger, the stronger he is, the better a blacksmith he is, and he passes the gene for big arms on to the kid, okay? Now, Lamarck didn't know anything about genetics because that wasn't discovered yet, but he had this concept that something gets passed from parent to offspring, and he believed that an acquired traits would do that. Now, another example of Lamarck in evolution would be that if you got a tattoo, which would be an acquired trait, then your children would get the exact same tattoo. All right, now, the best example of Lamarck in evolution, and this was used by Lamarck himself, was the adaptations of the giraffe. Now, the giraffe would come right here, originally had a shorter neck. Now, this giraffe knows that it has to reach up higher to get the leaves, so it would selectively use its neck. It would stretch it, and it would reach, and it would try to grab, and over time, using and using that neck and stretching it and working it, that neck would go, it would get taller. So over time, through selective use and disuse, the giraffe would get longer. That's Lamarckian evolution. And it gave a foundation for Darwin to start. So Darwin was intrigued. Hey, this French guy, French guy, he's got this idea about evolution, and this is his mechanism. Darwin, on his trip with the beagle, he begins to discount the mechanism, and he comes up with another one. And this is science in action. We typically build on another person's work. We either corroborate that person's work, or we improve upon it. And Darwin improves upon Lamarck. All right, and finally, the last guy to have a great influence upon Darwin was an economist, and his name was Thomas Malthus. So in your world history class or a geography class, you've probably talked about Malthusian economics. Well, um, uh, Thomas Malthus is a almost kind of a contemporary of, of, of Charles Darwin, right? Darwin's born in 1809, and um, Malthus's famous essay is written in 1798. So as Darwin's growing up and he's doing his learning in his school, he's going to come across the works of Thomas Malthus. Now, Thomas Malthus in 18, or I'm sorry, 1798, he stated, and I want you to really make a mark right here in your notes in this paragraph, is that if the human population continue to grow unchecked, we are eventually going to run out of resources to support this. Now, Malthus thought that this would happen much sooner because 1798, you're beginning to have the flickering beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. And he can see that we're going to be able to create this vast population, but you're going to run out of food, you're going to run out of shelter, you're going to run out of jobs. He says that's going to have a problem. And we're probably going to see that in your lifetime as we go through the 21st century. So Charles Darwin, being the keen mind that he has, he's reading Malthus's work and he's like, hmm, now, if that's going to apply to human beings, there's not going to be enough resources. It's going to be hard for all of them to survive. That probably really, really applies to the natural world because... Uh, lions and tigers and bear, oh my, they can't control their environment to the extent that humans can. So their limited resources should have a greater impact upon their lives and their lifespan. And it's Thomas Malthus's work that greatly helps Darwin uh, see, and, and actually, let me rephrase it this way, Malthus's work has a great impact upon his concept of 
natural selection. So when you think of survival of the fittest, you're seeing Malthusian economics in action in a scientific or biological scale. So I cannot stress enough how much Hutton and Lyell and Malthus had upon the work of, of Charles Darwin. In fact, as Darwin was heading out on his ship on the HMS Beagle, he's actually reading the works by Hutton and Lyell, and he's already familiar with Malsa, Malthus from his previous studies. Okay, So we're going to come back to these guys as we study a little bit more in some of these other episodes. So we're going to stop right there. That's going to end this episode. So until the next time, we're going to catch you on that flippity flip side. <laughs>